this is the beginning of our presentation and really we're calling it the introduction to the bond issuance process. Um, this is the disclosure, which I will spare everyone from reading. Um, and if we wanna come back to that, happy to do that. Um, I'm gonna start at the beginning, gonna start with the basics. And, and I, I know we've got a kind of a variety of, of expertise here um, from people that I know that have done multiple bond issues to people that are uh, still trying to, to figure out how to, how to do a project and, and get it financed. Um, so uh, basically we start off with what is a municipal bond and it's, it's easily put, is it's a promise to repay money. Um, and in the context of municipal bonds, uh, more technically it's a debt security issued by uh, a state, city, county, um, or their agency to, to finance projects. Um, the industry is regulated by the Securities and Exchange Commission. So we have um, many, many rules around uh, our business and th the rule book just keeps expanding uh, as I'm sure those of you in the school realm can relate to. Um, they never seem to take away anything, but they, they certainly add uh, to the, the regulatory world that we're living in. Um, a key component of municipal bonds and, and what makes them so attractive uh, to investors and allows for issuers like yourselves to get a low interest rate is the fact that they are generally issued as tax exempt bonds. Um, there are two keys to issuing tax exempt bonds. First, you have to use the proceeds for what is considered a governmental issue. Uh, you cannot go out, a school district cannot go out and build a uh, apartment building or a commercial building and have private business use uh, take over that, that building and use tax exempt bonds to do that. Additionally, or the second test is expenditure of proceeds. You need to spend your money within a certain amount of time. There have been issuers, uh, not recently, uh, but, but instances where issuers would go out and borrow money for 30 years. And this would be in a different interest rate environment that we're in today, but they borrow money for 30 years with no plans to build anything and invest that money over a period of time. And, and if they could borrow at 3%, invest at 4%, you make that 1% and, and use that to, to fund operations or do different things. And the, uh, the IRS who, uh, and the SEC are, are not fans of that practice. And, and so there are requirements around spending your money um, that uh, we can uh, perhaps yeah, talk about. Um, when when uh, considering a uh, municipal bond issue, there are some key objectives and, and considerations um, that, that we often talk about and have people keep in mind. Um, what are the kinds of projects that are planned? When are the funds needed? Uh, what revenues, if any, are available uh, to, to pay back the, the financing or what needs to be raised? And I think this, this slide really, to me, talks to, uh, the, well, the, the, the objectives talks to the kind of levy that a particular district may uh, find most beneficial uh, or the kind of financing. You have everything from voted bond issues, which I think everybody understands that concept and, and understands that because it's really the most widely used type of financing uh, in, in the state of Ohio. Um, so you have a, a, a voted bond issue, which is basically a single purpose uh, defined borrowing amount for a defined term um, and a defined use. So you would do a high school for 30 years um, of 30 million or whatever the numbers are in, in the particulars, but you're, you're very much locked into uh, what we've seen more recently are people doing uh, basically financing supported by a permanent improvement levy. Uh, many of you may have heard the uh, or understand the concept of certificates of participation or COPS. Uh, we have seen a, a really an explosion in the use of COPS uh, to finance projects 
because it gives you a little bit more flexibility around how you can repay those bonds. It's not as dedicated necessarily as a bond issue. You can pass a permanent improvement levy, or in some cases, you can use existing revenue. Uh, Dan and I are working on a project where a district is getting uh, revenue from a power plant, and we're going to use that revenue stream that's going to come in over 30 years and uh, build a new facility for that particular district. Uh, some of you may have heard uh, about some of the pipelines that are in Ohio. Nexus and Rover, most notably, uh, have, have resulted in a windfall for uh, many school districts. And, and we worked with quite a few that are uh, putting together financing supported by the revenue stream of the pipelines. If that is something that your particular district is considering, uh, we, we can talk about that. That, that could be uh, a presentation of an hour or more uh, in and of itself. So um, a lot of different paths for folks to go down and something that your financial professionals, um, whether it's someone like me or your bond counsel or uh, whoever um, you may wanna consider uh, talking with them on. Secondly, we have legal and policy restraints, um, sort of touched on what we, we or what I just mentioned, what kind of debt can be issued and, and what kind of approvals by a legislative body or electorate are required. Um, there are rules, very detailed rules about putting issues on uh, the ballot for consideration in the case of a voted bond issue and other levies. Um, I suspect most of you are very aware of those. Um, lastly, the financing options, how much debt can be supported and, and what are the credit considerations? Uh, something we spend a lot of time on as well is trying to make sense of new issues and, and how they fit around existing issues whether that's making a case to the community of reduced millage um, as millage drops off or, or any of those considerations, but something to, to, to pay attention to. Um, there are really two types of bond issues that, that we work on or financings, I should say, most generally you have what are known as new money, which of course is pretty self-explanatory, but basically used to fund new projects match the payments to the useful life of the asset. So if you want to borrow for computers, for instance, that have a, a life of maybe five years, it really wouldn't make sense to do a 30-year financing for that, and in some cases may not be permitted by state law. Um, and, and borrowing does a number of things. Um, it, basically, though, it, it spreads the equity or the burden of an asset over the life of the asset and the the life of the, ta the, the, the tax base uh, over time um, and, and allows people to pull their revenue forward and, and do a project today. Um, on the refunding side, fairly self-explanatory, basically, well, we, th that's a, a refunding is the term that we use in the municipal bond issue for refinancing, um, similar to a home mortgage, basically trading out uh, old bonds for, bonds with a lower interest rate and savings captured from that. I will note that the, the, the mechanics of a refunding uh, for a municipal bond issue can be a little bit more complicated than they would be for a home mortgage. And, and we'll, we'll touch on that here in a little bit. Um, in fact, we'll touch on it on this slide. Um, refundings, and they, they are uh, occurring all the time. Many, many districts have taken advantage of the low interest rate environment that we are currently in to issue refunding bonds. Um, there are two types of refundings. There are current refundings that are issued within 90 days of a bond issue's call date. A call date may be a, a new concept in that, or a concept that people aren't familiar with. Basically all bond issues have what is called a call date. Most, I, I shouldn't say all, most bond issues have a call date, which is a, a date in the future, typically in the eight, nine, 10 year range where bonds can be refinanced without penalty. Um, so when, when you get to that date and you go to refinance, that would be called a current refunding. Prior to that, 
you can do an advanced refunding, which is basically selling new bonds, placing the proceeds of those bonds in an escrow account to pay off the existing bonds ahead of that uh, current call date. So again, a more complicated topic that uh, we could probably spend uh, a significant amount of time on, um, but want to touch on it because it is happening. If you have outstanding bonds, it is very likely uh, that, or it's very possible, I should say, that, that the that there is savings to be realized by a refinancing. Um, the concept of a refinancing is shown in this graph. Basically, you're taking bonds that have higher interest rates and are longer and moving them down to uh, shorter maturities that have uh, lower interest rates. This, this graphic here is, is an attempt to show that moving down, kind of coming, uh, what we would call down the yield curve and changing longer callable maturities to shorter maturities and taking advantage of those interest rates. I'm gonna move now into the process of issuing bonds and, and some of the mechanics associated with it. Uh, a little bit of an overview. We've identified uh, six phases uh, in this the, the process, the initial process, which is really putting together your team, identifying the, the needs and uh, starting the process to accumulate documentation, which moves into the full documentation and due diligence phase, um, followed by rating agency and bond insurance, um, board slash council approvals, the marketing, pricing, and closing of the bonds, and then what occurs after the, uh, the, the bonds are closed and how the process is managed. Um, I think it's important to touch on the different roles that folks play. We have bond council, which um, in, in the state of Ohio is the, concentrated really in three bond council firms, uh, Squire Patton Boggs, Rick Maniloff, Mike Shar, Brian Callender are some of the professionals there. Uh, Bricker and Eckler, Becky Princehorn, Matt Stout, uh, Price Finley are some of the folks that, that do that work. At Dinsmore, you have uh, Dinsmore and Scholl is the third firm, and uh, Ed Cabeza, Brad Rui, Brenda Weimer, um, Jennifer Blazer are all people that uh, do that work uh, and, and are very specialized in the type of work that they do. Um, those three firms do probably about 80 to 90 percent of the work. Other, other bond council firms, Frost Brown Todd, uh, Retzel and Andrus. Um, so there, there, there's a, a you know, I think it's important as people consider the, a project to reach out to your bond council and get them engaged and get them thinking about some of the considerations of your, your project. You have the financial professionals, folks like me. Um, I work for an underwriting firm. We do uh, underwritings and, and ultimately sell your bonds. Um, every transaction has an underwriter on it in some capacity and um, increasingly, the role of financial advisor is something that uh, we are seeing across the board. Um, financial advisors are uh, individuals often that, that work with the school district to develop the plan and, and work in concert with underwriters to, to assist in the process. Um, our role is to structure financing, market the bonds, set the prices for the bonds, and ultimately sell them to investors. Uh, we work to assemble documents, including the official statement. Underwriters Council is the attorneys that are the attorneys that that work with the underwriter. Um, other participants: bond registrar and paying agent, typically a bank uh, that works to to process the payments and make sure that the school district is sending money to the investors and that there's no hiccups with that payment and that folks get paid on time. And the rating agency, um, really three options here, uh, or pretty much two options, uh, Moody's or Standard & Poor's, certainly names I would suspect most of you have heard before. Uh, out there, Fitch is another rating agency that rates a few Ohio school districts. Um, and their job is to assign a credit rating to serve as a proxy to the, the market 
in, in terms of the interest rate and the credit worthiness of the particular issue. Um, as we think about uh, structuring the issue, um, really three considerations. You have your, your bond uh, proceeds uh, and the terms and conditions around the issuance. You have the credit and legal analysis and then the financial options. Um, our goal and the goal of the financing team is to, to take all of those considerations, put them together and, and develop the op optimal financing plan. Um, some of the, the considerations as we go through this process uh, on the structuring side are the size of the financing. How much do you need? That's, that's a pretty basic question. Um, and when are the proceeds needed? Millage parameters. Uh, what does the principal repayment look like and, and everything around the repayment of the, per, the particular financing. Um, additionally, uh, there's always conversations around the call date, the ability to refinance. How can you position yourself on the front end to maximize savings on the, the back end and, uh, and, and uh, take advantage of what may be changing interest rates? So uh, key documents um, authorized by the, uh, the, what we call the governing board or the board of uh, education in the case of a school district, um, getting it on the agenda is typically assisted by bond council. You have an authorizing resolution, um, which is a resolution that permits the district to go forward with the financing. You have draft financing documents, um, for those of you that have done financing before the preliminary official statement is kind of the marquee document in the process. Um, embedded in that is the continuing disclosure certificate, uh, bond registrar agreement, uh, DTC agreement, and then uh, a bond purchase agreement is also uh, important to have and, and certainly a, a important document in, in the sale process. Um, uh, another element of this is debt policies and procedures. A lot of folks have policies and thoughts around when to issue bonds and what the bond issue looks like. Um, and that policy, a debt policy would set that. Um, the preliminary official statement for those of you who uh, don't know or have repressed the memory of working on it um, is basically the marketing document for uh, the issue. Um, inevitably, someone has purchased uh, securities and, and you get those little pamphlets in the mail after you make a purchase. And um, at least in my household, they very, end, uh, very quickly end up uh, in the trash. Um, they're, they're typically small printed in, in small font and really have not found much exciting in there. Um, when you purchase a mutual fund or those type of things. But that, that document is basically the same thing as what we try to accomplish with the preliminary official statement. It is everything about the issue that, that an investor would need to know. Um, and so there are uh, a lot of, of pieces to it and um, a lot of considerations. Um, we're gonna to touch on specifically uh, the official statement. Um, five components on the cover, the, the par amount, which is uh, basically the, the way we talk about the size of the issue, the date of date, which is the date uh, in which interest starts accruing, also known as the closing date or delivery date, the call features, which we touched on a little bit, the, the time in which you can refinance without penalty, the rating implications, uh, or the ratings are provided typically in the upper right hand column or uh, corner and are um, important to the investors to understand the credit worthiness of the issue related. Any information about a bond insurer uh, is provided on the cover of the official statement. Within the official statement is, is a number of uh, pieces of information, financial in uh, information, enrollment, how you're gonna spend the money, um, basically everything you wanted to know about this particular school district. Um, and I'm not going to read all these, but you can see um, really it's a pretty exhaustive review of the, the district itself. 
Um, as we get into uh, the bond process, we have marketing, pricing, and closing. Um, the, the biggest component of, of marketing is the, the credit rating piece, which I, I mentioned a minute ago. This, this table I think is good because it, it really shows the breakdown of ratings. Um, I think a lot of people know that AAA is the highest rating. Uh, when you're talking about AAA rated um, school districts, it's, it's districts like um, Upper Arlington, Orange uh, schools up in the Cleveland area, uh, Great Oaks in the Cincinnati area. Um, those are all examples of AAA rated school districts by Dublin, I believe, uh, as a AAA by Standard & Poor's. So you have really, really highly rated and, and financially secure districts, typically suburban districts in the uh, around Columbus, Cleveland, or Cincinnati are, are where you're going to see those. Um, then a lot of districts, uh, again, typically the suburban districts around Columbus, Cleveland, and Cincinnati will carry uh, ratings in that high grade. Um, category, um, you know, for instance, Westerville Schools is double A1, um, double A2, uh, we work with Centerville Schools in, or Kettering Schools in, in the Dayton area, they're double A2, uh, Centerville Schools is double A1. So just, you know, really strong districts that maybe don't have the wealth of an Upper Arlington or a Dublin um, or an Orange or, or, or the tax base of a Great Oaks. Um, what we call the upper medium grade, that A1 category for Moody's is the most frequently assigned rating for Ohio school districts. About 40% of Ohio school districts fall in that A1 category, the high end of the, the A category. Um, and then as you go down, you can see um, how the, the, the ratings get lower. I will note that, that really most, with, with the exception of a handful of, of districts, most are in the A category or above. So what we've identified is that upper medium range, the high grade or the prime, uh, that's where most, probably all but maybe five or six uh, Ohio school districts fall and then some are in that lower medium grade and, and really only one I believe is in that speculative category um, and nothing below that. So um, a little, background on that I think is important to know as, as you go forth. Certainly the higher the interest rate or the, the I'm sorry, the higher the credit rating, the lower the interest rate. Um, same with your own credit score, right? The, the, the higher your own personal credit rating, the better your borrowing rates are going to be. The same applies to school districts. Um, I will note that Moody's is in the process, um, well, has completed the process of altering and adjusting their methodology for Ohio school districts. So this is a, a pretty rapidly evolving conversation and something we're paying a lot of attention to. Uh, on a very high level, um, Moody's has come in and decided that tax base, the size of a particular issuer's tax base is less relevant than the size of their enrollment and whether or not a district is growing in terms of enrollment. Um, we are trying to understand exactly what that means and what the implications are. There are about 15 districts that will get downgraded as a result of this change. And there are about 20 districts, I think, that are gonna get upgraded as a result of this change. So um, something to pay attention to if you're, uh, if if you're in the market and, and are going to be in the market. Um, another, another concept to introduce here is what we call credit enhancement. Uh, comes really for Ohio school districts in two forms. One is bond insurance, which we have outlined here. The other is the Ohio school district credit enhancement program, which is a program that allows Ohio school districts to uh, basically have the state intervene and give a rating to the bonds of AA2, which is the third highest uh, category of, of ratings by Moody's. 
or double A by S and P. So in either case, it, it can provide value. It's a free program and something that uh, is is often very valuable. This this particular visual here shows uh, some of the the inputs into a credit rating. Um, the, the biggest ones really are the, the district's finances um, and, and combined with that is what we're calling liquidity. You know, what does your five-year forecast look like and how much cash do you have on hand? Um, additionally, as I mentioned, Moody's has placed a, a, a significant infinance, a, emphasis on um, enrollment, whether it's growing uh, or or declining, and, and that's something that we're going to be paying attention to, and, and I think a lot of school districts will be uh, familiar with here as, as that evolves. Um, so once we get past the credit rating process, we do a marketing, which is basically reaching out to investors and talking about their particular issue uh, and, and trying to drum up support. That comes in a number of different ways. Um, and, and the preliminary official statement, which we talked about earlier, is the primary marketing document. Send that around, send the credit rating reports around and try to get uh, indications of interest. Um, every investor has their own process and, um, and whether they, they have their own credit approval process and whether a particular district qualifies. Um, further, we touch here on the pricing process, which is, we call we call it pricing. It, it is really known as the day of sale as well. Basically the, the window in which, that is open for, for folks to place their orders and reserve a portion of the bond issue. Um, it, 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 it's been a very interesting market for pricings lately. Um, we have uh, seen issues be very, very popular. Um, earlier this week on Tuesday, we sold a seven and a half million dollar issue for a district in the Cincinnati area that got uh, $25 million in bonds, uh, in, in orders of bonds. So a, that's very commonplace these days as, uh, as people are trying to put money into the municipal bond market. It's, it's really quite amazing how low interest rates have become and how much competition there is for, for new issues. Um, brings up the question, why do investors buy municipal bonds and who are the investors of municipal bonds? Um, broadly, there are two types. There are retail investors, which are individuals, folks like you and I, that, that may have some money to, to purchase bonds, whether it's for retirement or kids college or just uh, safekeeping. Uh, and then institutional investors. And institutional investors probably account for certainly in excess of 90%, maybe in many cases, 100% of the, the purchasers of, of municipal bonds that we work on. Um, they are definitely the drivers of the market. And you can see in the pie graph um, how the breakdown is. Um, the, the blue that shows individuals, um, typically those are held in what we would call uh, municipal bond funds. It is not individuals that are buying, going out and buying individual pieces. It's folks that are buying parts of the Nuveen tax exempt Ohio fund or the Franklin tax exempt fund um, as a part of a broader investment strategy. Um, so uh, some thoughts here, different investors have different objectives uh, and, and all have, different requirements relative to credit quality and interest rates. Um, so uh, that's a thought. Here is a list of terms uh, around the uh, bond pricing process that, that I think are important, but not so important that I'm gonna spend 15 minutes walking through them. Um, you have uh, coupon yield and price uh, at the top of that page that are important to, to understand um, and, and pay attention to um, something that is uh, very commonplace in today's market is the idea of a premium bond 
where the coupon is higher than the yield. Um, and in some cases, it is dramatically higher. You may have a 5% coupon for a bond that yields uh, one and a half percent. So in the little graphic we have here, where you have the, the, the pendulum or the, the, I guess the lever, um, it is you know, much more, uh, much steeper than what we're showing in, in many cases. So um, premium bonds seem to be what investors are after these days. And um, that's a market uh, situation that we're always trying to, to uncover. What, what is the most attractive couponing structure for a particular uh, issue? Post-closing, um, this is uh, basically a, a discussion of what are the requirements. Once you have sold bonds, you've been in the market, you've got your money, what do you have to do after that? The, the big topic uh, that is relatively new is continuing disclosure. Basically, you have reporting requirements for your outstanding bonds. Um, and you have an obligation to keep the investors of those bonds apprised of changes in the district and, and annually folks have to disclose uh, different pieces of information related to that. So it's not as if you sell the bonds and close the bonds and are off the hook and have nothing further to do. There is a, a continuing requirement to disclose material information about the school district. Um, this is a page that gets into the, the nuts and bolts of that, something that uh, I'm not sure we need to spend a ton of time on, but um, except to know that that obligation exists, it is um, fairly straightforward and something that your typically your bond council can help you with. Um, you can uh, contract with many of the bond council firms to do this filing for you, which is something that I think makes a lot of sense given that it is a very specialized uh, piece of information and, and often changing. Um, to that point, uh, I think it is important to note that the, the rules have changed. If you are not aware of that, it may be worth reaching out to your members of your financing team if you have outstanding bonds to make sure you're complying with the rules uh, of continuing disclosure um, and, and being in compliance. The two new rules are around financial obligations, which basically anytime you borrow money, you now have to disclose that uh, to existing bondholders. Further resources on this, which I would be stunned if anyone actually goes and looks up, but uh, we have um, the MSRB, EMA, which is the Electronic Municipal Market Access, GFOA, the IRS. Tons of information out there, out there about municipal bonds if people are looking for it. Also probably easier to call a financial professional and, and have that conversation. Third section here of what I'm gonna talk about is the market. Probably the question I get asked the most is where are interest rates? Um, and really in, in this day and age, it's, it's pretty remarkable where interest rates are. Um, you can see on the, the graph on the left that is labeled AAA GO, that is AAA rated general obligation bonds. Um, and and uh, the blue line indicates 10 year maturities and the orange line indicates 30 year maturities. Um, the, the headline here is pretty, pretty simple. Um, rates are really, really low. Uh, if, if you look historically over this 10 year period, there are very few times where interest rates are lower than they are today. Um, I got into this business uh, a little bit less than 20 years ago, um, about 19 and a half years ago. And interest rates have gone down basically every year that I have been in this business. Um, I keep telling folks that they're going to go up and I keep being wrong. Um, it, is, it is remarkable where they are. Um, it is a great time to be in the market. Um, it's, it seems preposterous uh, and uh, where the, that people can borrow money for the rates that they're borrowing at, but it is 
for better or worse, the reality that we are in um, and, and a great opportunity for, for folks like yourselves to, to be out there borrowing money. I'll say that uh, I referenced the Cincinnati area school district that we sold bonds for earlier this week. Um, they borrowed over 20 years, their interest rate was 1.81%, which is kind of an astonishing number. Um, so again, very, very low interest rates. Um, and, and I think that also <laughs> leads to the question of where are interest rates going? Um, and the, the easy answer is up uh, in some cases. Um, what we have here uh, at the top of this page are uh, what we call yield curve projections, but basically where are, it, it answers the question where are interest rates going. You have a Fed funds rate that uh, from our economist, which is the, the upper left-hand table, is, is expecting that rate to remain flat through the entirety of 2021. And for two-year rates to go up slightly, 10-year uh, rates to kind of bounce around, uh, dipping in the first quarter and then rising uh, to 1% in the third quarter, and then uh, the 30 year rates kind of following the same trend um, where they come down in the near term and go basically to where they are at the end of the year. The, the market consensus uh, is, is a little bit different, um, a little bit more aggressive in terms of where interest rates are going to go. It'll be interesting to see who's right, the Stiefel economist or the market consensus. Um, and the market consensus is the economists or economists from uh, maybe 10 or 12 different financial services firms and they take all their predict predictions, put them together and come out with this market consensus. Um, you can see below some of the key uh, discussion points, vaccine discovery, um, GDP growth and what the stimulus bill looks like are, are three drivers of the, the interest rate market. Um, that is the end of my presentation. I kind of buzzed through that quickly. Um, and sadly, I don't see any questions out there. Um, perhaps it's because somebody wants to come off mute and ask a question in person or, um, or not. But um, a lot of information. Hopefully it was helpful. Or, and I, I kind of cast the net to ask questions. Or Dan, if you have any questions, uh, you know, pipe in. I, I'm anticipating what Dan's question is going to be based on a conversation we had earlier. Um, and a hot topic these days is ESSER funds. Um, so not part of our presentation, but I can talk on that at least briefly and say that um, ESSER funds are, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I, uh, well, ESSER funds are um, I think, as all you know, um, very flexible in, in what they can be used for. There are many uh, districts that are using them for uh, construction-related projects. There is an example of a use would be to apply them to uh, air quality-related issues. Uh, if you're doing a project on a building, um, and you have $2 million in ESSER funds and uh, part of the project is a million dollars in uh, new air handling and, and cooling systems for your building that would increase the air quality. Uh, you could directly apply a portion or all of those ESSER funds to, um, to the project. It's, it, you know, it's, there are details associated with this. Certainly not as straightforward as what uh, what I may have just described, and something to consult with your bond council on, as as they're really tracking this and paying attention to the the issue. So, um, evolving situation for sure. Patrick, this is Marv. Yeah. Once the bond issues passed, how long does it take? Uh, to get things done and then finally selling your, your yeah, great question and, and probably should have had a little detail on that. You know, it's a it's about a 12 week process um, from the time that you uh, you you hit go until you have money in the bank. 
Um, in some cases, it can be 10 weeks. In some cases, it can be 16 weeks or longer. But I think a good rule of thumb is about three months until money in the bank. Um, the, the, the construction of the official statement, which we talked about, is really the biggest driver in that process. Um, if somebody wants to take that on and handle that in a very short amount of time, you can really accelerate the timetable. But that oftentimes, in my experience, is the is what drives the schedule uh, the most. So uh, does that answer your question, Mark? Yeah, that answers that. And how soon should a school district start you know, investigating what it might cost them? I'm sorry, say, what was the second part of that? Investigate? Yeah. You know, you're thinking of doing a facility project. One of the things you have to do, I know you're going to find out what the millage is, but when should you start that process of starting investigating yeah. that kind of cost? Sure, absolutely. Uh, good question. Uh, you know, we we advise people and when we talk to folks, we, we really tell them it can't be early. You, know, you can't be too early to it. Um, understanding the process, um, understanding what is required, what will be needed. Um, there's no downside to that. Um, a lot of the professionals that that work on this, myself included, we we don't charge an hourly fee or a um, have a retainer or anything along those lines. We basically get paid when the financing closes. So we encourage people to use us as far in advance of the the, the actual date in which they're going to be on the ballot or do the financing as they are comfortable with. Um, we like to think we. We know a little bit about this and can be a resource as the district goes forward um, and, and want to be help, as helpful as we possibly can uh, in that process. So, um, you know, I, I would, there's no downside to reaching out early and, and getting information from folks to right. understand the process so that you're prepared when you go forward. Yes, it's, and for, a, you know, superintendent or even a treasurer who's never been involved in a facility project, it can be overwhelming. At least that's, that, was that was my personal experience. And I was able to go through it twice, but there were a number of years in between. So you forget a lot of stuff. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. And that's, I mean, I think you bring up a, a really important point, Barb, in that a lot of folks that are school district superintendents and treasurers are not doing this every day. You might you might do it twice in a career, you know, right. and, and, and there are people out there, uh, whether it's people from our firm or there's certainly different firms and, you know, the bond councils that we talked about who are really out there to assist folks in this process. Um, you are not an expert in this. You are not intended to be an expert in this. And, and we encourage people to reach out and, and work with who they're comfortable with uh, and, and who they like and, and think can provide the most value to the district. So, um, you know, it's, 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 I, I don't think any reasonable board of education expects treasurers and superintendents to build a building and go through this process of financing the construction of a building without financial professionals involved uh, yeah. every step of the way. So, uh, so, so Marv, back to your earlier question, and I agree with Patrick. Uh, totally. When, when you think about our master planning efforts and community engagement, this sort of eventually as we start to define that master plan, this question starts to come up, how much will this cost us? Yeah. So yeah. You know, even in that early master planning, uh, I've reached out to Patrick a number of times. It's like, you know, I don't want to try to answer these questions. Please, please come help. <laughs> yeah, and, and, you know, to, that can be a very nuanced question. It's, you know, uh, Any more, I feel like it's it's very complicated um, or can be complicated. We'd like to use part of an income tax. We want to do property tax. We have an existing PI levy. How can we use all these revenue streams to minimize the burden on the taxpayer and do the the best project we can? Um, I, I think once upon a time, and, and maybe still for a lot of districts, there are folks that uh, can just do a bond issue and put it on the ballot and, and hope for the best. But increasingly, it's, it's, a, it's a more uh, complicated conversation than just let's put on a property tax-based bond issue, put some millage on the ballot and hope that it passes. Um, 
So it, it's always good to have folks having those conversations because it can be nuanced. Well, seeing as there's no other questions. Yeah, go to the, yeah, go to the last slide, if you would, please. So, uh, thank you. We're just, uh, I don't know, a few minutes early. We'll start to wrap up here. If anybody has more questions, um, we'll open it up again. But um, just wanted everybody to know that a copy of this will be forwarded to them, emailed to them. Uh, we certainly appreciate everybody joining us. Any last questions before we wrap it up? Patrick, I really appreciate it. Oh, and the upcoming presentation, Bill Cedar, um, really interesting program. Bill's been able to accomplish quite a bit through this partnership, this public, uh, this private and public partnership. So I'd encourage people to attend that one. So with that, um, We'll uh, wrap this up. Thanks again, Patrick. Really yeah. good. Thanks for, for having me and thanks to everyone for uh, staying awake throughout it.